We have 18 people. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us on yet another episode of Self of Life. Let's dive right into our episode today with this trivia question. Which province is home to Canada's tallest mountain? Um, 
you know that I'm going to reveal the answer in the end, but you can share this image and your answer on Instagram with the hashtag Southup Live, um, and we may feature it on our feed. You can also comment below, but please don't Google. Um, okay, now let's start our show. In today's episode, Brandy is back to talk about the speaking section, um, task eight, part two. If you want to stay updated on Brandy's episodes, please subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon to receive notifications for when she airs. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook, where we update everyone with our latest episode topics. Um, importantly, please ask yourself the test related questions here in the comments below today. Many of you had questions about the test during the common English errors video. Um, this is your chance to ask your doubts. Um, so please go ahead. Hi, Brandy. Welcome back. How are you doing? I am doing very well. Thanks. It's very nice to see you again on another sunshiny day in Vancouver. Enjoy it before the rain hits because it's coming this weekend. <laughs> the rain. Yes. Um, I'm odd in that I enjoy the rain from in indoors. Um, I enjoy most of the weather from indoors, um, you know, but uh, I like the rain and I like the snow. So uh, this weekend, I'm really looking forward to this weekend. Um, but yeah, I'm going to let you start it with, you, uh, with your presentation. Excellent. All right. I'm just going to take a moment here to share my screen. If you can just give me a moment to do that, please. Okay. All right. So we are here today to finish up actually with our speaking series. We're going to look back at task eight. Uh, now, last time we talked about task eight, we looked at describing some objects using some descriptive language. And in today's episode, we're going to focus on describing the actions that we see when we're provided with an image in task eight of the cell PIP test. Now, these images will always be unusual because task eight is all about describing an unusual situation. So what you're looking at right now is a, a real past cell PIP test question. Uh, the test takers there were shown this exact image and you can see the question here on the screen as well. So the question they were meant to answer is you are at a tourist site and see some street performers. Call your friend Katya and describe in detail what the performers are doing and ask her if she would like to see the event. So in this episode, what I'd really like to do is focus on the skill set that we need in order to successfully describe the actions that we're looking at in this picture itself. So we're going to focus on what these exact performers are doing in this image. And we're also going to practice the skill by looking at this fun image. Now, this is not a cell pip test image. This is an image that I found on Shutterstock that I just happen to really enjoy because it's a nice family outing. So if this were an image that you were trying to describe, you might start your scene by providing an overview. This is what you would do on the cell PIP test. So you might say, I am looking at an image of a family enjoying a picnic in the park. You would then start to pick and choose the people in the scene that you want to describe. So I might start with the father on the right hand side of the blanket. And I could simply say the father is reading a book. You know, if I wanted to go next to looks like that young boy beside him, I might say the young boy is clutching a soccer ball to his chest. So whenever you are asked to describe what you're looking at, there is a certain structure or, or routine uh, grammar structure that you want to get in the habit of using. So here again is the sentence we just looked at. You always want to start with the person. This is the subject. So you see the, the word I in orange there. So this is me, I'm talking about what I'm looking at first, and the action is am looking. When I talk about the father, I mention his name first, and then I describe his action there is reading. And last but not least, the young boy is my person. What is he doing? He is clutching a soccer ball to his chest. So on your cell pip test, part of your score is going to come from how well you use grammar structures as you speak, how well you can speak in complete sentences, and also on how precise and interesting your vocabulary is. So we're going to put all of those skills together in order to really hone in uh, on how to be successful for this task. 
So when you're asked to describe what's happening in that image, I want you to use the present continuous verb tense. This is the verb tense that indicates the action is happening right now at this very moment. So that's why we call it the present. And you're describing the action as if it's ongoing in the scene. So it's continuing on as you're speaking about it. This is why we call this verb tense the present continuous. So here is one of our sample sentences. The father is reading a book. And I just want to make sure everyone has the correct form. So when it comes time to speak on into the test itself, you're going to, again, start with your subject. Always identify the person specifically that you're going to be talking about. So the subject in this sentence is orange, just to keep it straight. Now, the verb isn't challenging. It just takes a bit of memory work to remember that you need two specific words to make up the complete verb when you're talking about this task. So you'll notice that there's one little tiny verb that comes first. This is not an action. This is actually a linking verb. That word is, is going to connect your subject to the verb or the action in the rest of the sentence. So because you're talking about this action as it's happening in the present, we need to use present tense linking verbs. And they're going to come from the verb to be. So the only choices you have here for this verb tense would be am, is, or are. So we have to look at the subject. And the father is just one person. This is what we refer to as a third person singular. The only verb linking verb that makes sense there would be is. We could not say the father am, for example, that would be incorrect. So we select the correct linking verb. And then the next word you choose should be some sort of, hopefully it's an action verb. So you see the root verb there to read. And all we need to remember to do is to add the ing ending to that root verb. So we have is reading. Those two words complete the verb. And then, of course, the father happens to be reading a book. So we have finished the sentence. So this is the simple form that we're going to use every time we're describing actions as they happen. Okay, so we'll go back to this real cell pip test question from the past. So if I wanted to refer to these two people, maybe uh, I'll think of them as the men together. I might say the men are making music. So that would be one way to introduce this scene if I were asked to describe it to a friend. Um, if I wanted to, to individualize them, I could speak about the drummer first. So this is the person on the left. So I might say the drummer is striking metal lids. If I now want to talk about the other man on the right hand side, I might refer to him as the blonde man, just to keep him straight in the image. So the blonde man is circling the water glasses with the brush. So again, we've got our person or the subject first. Then you have the linking verb next. And you'll notice that these three linking verbs that we just underlined are different. In the first case, we're using are because our subject, the men, is plural. Since we've got more than one person, we have to choose are. In the next two example sentences, we've only got one person we're talking about, and that's why you see the linking verb is. Okay, and then after that linking verb, again, you see these action verbs with the ing. So with this verb tense in mind, we're just going to create a couple of example sentences together here. So going back to this, this casual picture of the family, I suppose, having a picnic, if I wanted to now talk about the mother, I have to introduce her, her name first. In this case, I'll just refer to her as the mother. I select the correct linking verb, which would be is, because she's one person. And then all you need to do is think of an action. Try to make it interesting if you can. So we might say the mother is offering an apple to her son. Or maybe we could say the mother is sitting cross-legged on the blanket. So you would continue in this fashion to describe what everyone in the scene is doing on your test. Okay, likewise, let's practice a few more with these two gentlemen here. I might say the musicians are playing beautiful music. I could also say the musicians are enjoying their day at the park. Okay, so again, present continuous, using it when we're talking about the actions that are happening right now. So now that we've got that verb tense in the back of our mind, we're going to add on one more little step. And this is going to help, I think, with both your speaking and your writing on the cell pip. So I often think of English speakers as being a little bit lazy in the sense that if there's a shortcut, we will often take it. 
We like to blend sounds together and take less time sometimes to share ideas. So we're going to use what's called an apostrophe. The apostrophe is that little tiny grammatical, it's a punctuation mark. It looks a bit like a comma, but you'll see it there on the top line. And this little apostrophe connects the subject to the linking verb. So it makes it shorter and usually easier to pronounce. So you could say, I am looking, but you probably would say, I'm looking, right? It's faster and it's easier. Both of these are acceptable on your CELPIP speaking test. Okay, look at number two there. You could say the drummer is striking, or you could also say the drummer striking. So you can practice those short forms and use them fluently. Remember, CELPIP is going to test you on your day-to-day -day conversational English skills. And most English speakers would use the short form anyway. So it's perfectly acceptable to speak this way as you record your answers on the test. Okay, and if you're studying at home, I wanted to provide this little chart just for a little resource. You can see in the left-hand column here, you've got subjects all the way down. So these are pronouns that represent people. So you might have I, you, he, she, it, they, and we. You'll notice the correct linking verb there beside each of those subjects. So again, these are taken from the verb to be in the present tense because we're focusing on creating a present continuous verb tense. So once you've learned those correctly, all we need to do is blend the sounds. So instead of I am, we can go over to the right-hand column and say I'm. Instead of you are, we have your. So these contractions or short forms, again, are easier and usually they're easier to pronounce as well. So you use whichever one is more comfortable for yourself, but they are both very acceptable. So with all of this in mind, what I'd like to do next then is actually listen to part of a, a past test taker's response. So on the test, this test taker gave this answer. We're going to listen to the part of his response where he actually calls his friend Katya and describes in detail what these performers are doing. So we won't listen to the full response. We're not right now interested in having him invite her down and so on. Again, we just want to see how he's describing these actions correctly. So as we listen to today's response, I am going to show you the transcript so that we can read along with it as we hear it. Uh, remember on your CELPIP test, you're never going to have a transcript for the speaking. Uh, we're using it here today just so we can study this verb tense correctly. All right, now this was a higher level response. So the verb tenses used here are already correct. We don't have any corrections to make in this particular response you're about to hear. Um, he uses three examples of this present continuous verb tense correctly. There are a couple of other verb tenses too that are also correct, but we're not going to get into those other tenses today. Let's just focus on the present continuous. So again, as you listen, see if you can identify that structure. You're looking for the subject, the linking verb, and then the root verb with the ing ending. See if you can find those three examples. After you've heard the response, I'll show you where they are. Okay, let's take a listen now. Start speaking now. Hey, Katya. So I'm standing outside the Capilano suspension bridge. I'm really excited to see it. But right outside, there's these two street performers who are really amazing. One of them is a bucket drummer. So he's taken all these kind of household uh, implements and containers and he's using them as drums. And they're really, he's, re he's doing a really great job. Okay, so again, that was about half of his response where he focused on describing the actions. So you can see here, I've highlighted and color coded again. We've got three examples. The subjects or the people are all in orange, and then the linking verb and that root verb ing follows in blue. And you can see here as a fluent speaker that he has used that contraction form, the short form in every instance of creating this verb tense. So he has I'm standing, he's using, and he's doing. Okay, so that's something that we want to work towards as we practice uh, describing the actions in these scenes. So let's follow that up with a second response now as well. We're only again going to listen to half of the response. So it will be the part where the speaker phone or calls Katya to describe what is happening in this scene. 
Now, I will let you know that this response is not a real test taker's response. This one was written by staff so that we could have a look at how to improve or correct some of the more common errors that people make as they're trying to describe these scenes in task eight. So there are three examples again of correct usage of this verb tense. So as we listen here, we're going to still try to find those three examples. But more importantly, there are three errors as well with these verb tenses. And these errors are very common mistakes that people make, especially as they're trying to learn English as an additional language. So I'm giving you a lot of work to do from home now. You're multitasking. So you're looking for correct examples of present continuous. You're also looking for three mistakes. So after we've heard this response, we will identify those and correct the errors together. Let's listen in now. Hi, Katya. I'm listening to two musicians perform a concert in the park. One man using plastic buckets and metal garbage cans as a drum set. He bangs the pails with wooden sticks to keep a steady beat. The other performer is making music with glasses filled with water. He's rolling a brush around the rim of each glass to create a song. These musicians are create beautiful music. Okay, so we're going to start with the, uh, the correct usages of this verb. So once again, there are three, you can see them here. So we have I'm listening at the top. The second example uses the full form. There's no contraction. We have the other performer is making, and that's okay. We don't have to always use that short form. And our third example here would be he's rolling. So I'm hoping you've identified those. Sometimes looking for that action verb with the ing helps clue you in to where the action is unfolding. Okay, now the harder part of this is to identify the errors. So I'm going to underline the first mistake that is actually quite common, again, uh, particularly as people are learning the language. So this example in the second sentence here that's underlined, it says one man using plastic buckets and metal garbage cans. So we have the person, we've got the, the subject, which is the man. We know what he's doing. We've got that action word with the ing. So we can see that he's using these buckets. But what this speaker has accidentally left out of the response is that little tiny linking verb that we've spoken about now. We absolutely have to have a linking verb. Otherwise, your, your verb is incomplete, which means your sentence is, is not complete either. And if we make this mistake over and over again, it's going to start to hurt your score on the cell PIP test under the category of listenability. So this is when the raters are listening in to see if you are speaking in complete sentences and if your grammar is correct. Okay, so it's a small, tiny word, but we absolutely have to have it for this verb tense to complete the entire sentence. So we're selecting is because again, it matches the subject, the singular man. So one man is using. So we've corrected that mistake. The second error is a little bit harder to spot maybe, it's here in the next sentence. So this one says he bangs. He bangs the pails with wooden sticks. So all by itself, you know, that sentence is actually correct grammatically. The problem with it is we are describing the action in the scene as it's happening. This structure, he bangs, is the simple present verb tense. And we don't want to use simple present when we're describing the action. We want to talk about it as the action is happening now and unfolding. And that's why we're learning this present continuous verb tense. So we're going to change the verb tense altogether. Instead of he bangs, we are going to make it he is banging. So you see now that it's consistent. It's the same verb tense that you're using uh, throughout the rest of the response. And this is something to note again, both in speaking and writing. There's, if there's no good reason to change your verb tense, don't change it. It's confusing for the listener if we are constantly jumping back and forth between different verb tenses. So all of the actions being described using the same tense, which happens to be present continuous for this exact task. Okay, so we've corrected that one. There's one more mistake, which again is quite common, particularly for people practicing English as a second language. So at the bottom here, we've got our subject, that's fine. We've got the musicians, so we know who we're speaking about. We've even got the correct linking verb, we have are. 
we needed to choose that plural word because musicians is more than one person. So, so far it's great. We've got an action verb, which is create. And I like the verb itself, it's interesting. But what's missing here is again, the ending. We need to correct that structure by simply adding the ing to the action verb. So as soon as we say these musicians are creating beautiful music, we have corrected the entire piece. Okay, so keep in mind this response was about 30 seconds long. It's half the response. On the test itself, you will be speaking for a full minute. So I think it's a good goal to have to aim for, I would say describe at least maybe five different parts of the scene. You could even add in some more descriptive language. And remember for task eight, there are other parts that you're supposed to speak about. You actually have to invite your friend down and see if she wants to come and so on. So we're not going to listen to that part of this response today simply because we wanted to focus on the, the grammar. But keep that in mind. This is a really nice, um, strongly corrected final version of the description of the action anyway, which is the main part of that scene. So just to summarize then what we've done, we know we need to use present continuous when we're describing actions that are happening right now at this very moment and are ongoing as we talk about them. So we've looked at these sentences before. We can clearly see that we start with the person who we're talking about. We then select the correct linking verb. And then we uh, consider the action verb and add the ing. So that's how we're creating this form. And a helpful tip, remember, you're going to very likely use this skill in both tasks three, where you're given an image to describe what's happening. And again, in the middle part of task eight, when you're also describing what's happening in that scene. Okay, so I'm going to hold it there. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now so I can come back. And if there are any questions, I will gladly answer them today. I'll maybe throw it back out to Ashwati and see if anyone has any questions for us. <laughs> mm -hmm. We do have questions. Um, one of them um, is a grammar question. Um, what is the difference between it's and it? So I-T-S and I-T apostrophe S. Okay, good. I wish I had a whiteboard. I could write these out, but you'll have to just imagine in your mind these words. So when we say I-T apostrophe S, that's the, the subject verb. That represents it is. So think of that little apostrophe as taking the place of the letter I in the verb, right? When you have it is, you take out the I from that second word and you connect it back. So it's in that sense is the subject verb. And that's the, the first part of creating this present continuous. When we just say it's I-T-S, what we're doing is showing belonging. It's not a verb at all. So I might say the dog chased its tail because the tail belongs to the dog itself. When you're speaking, it's not going to matter so much because we can't hear the apostrophe. When you're writing though, you absolutely have to include the apostrophe only when you're intending to create that linking verb that we looked at. Very important or you're going to confuse the reader. That's a great question. Thanks for sharing that one. Um, no problem. Thank you for asking us that question. Here is another one. Um, is there one part of self speaking that isn't marked? Like, do we have bonus? questions in this other test? Uh, okay, sometimes during the test itself, there might be a question that is uh, unscored. When that happens, you're not going to know whether it's scored or not. But occasionally these questions are added there more for research purposes. So it might be a new content question that is being assessed for validity and so on and for high quality. So the trick is we have to answer all the questions on the test to the best of our ability. Uh, every time because again as the test taker we're not going to know which one is scored and which one is not. Now I don't know if there would be a speaking one that would be unscored because you only have usually you've just got the one question for the speaking task uh, but yeah do be aware occasionally you might come across a question that's not scored for marks but answer it anyway to the best of your ability just in case it is marked you'll never know. <laughs> Great, um, thank you. And I hope that answered your question. This one is a longer one. And this one was asked last week, uh, sorry, two weeks before when we did the common errors question, but this is very much pertaining to the topic at hand. Um, in the speaking section, where I have to describe and imagine, what if there is a paper and I see it as something else and continue describing the wrong thing? Um, 
how are my marks assessed in that situation? Okay, so in, let me think now. The pictures that we looked at today, I think were pretty self-explanatory. Like you would know you're looking at two men making music or a family on a, on a, a blanket at a picnic. So those are maybe not great examples to take. But let's say I have seen other practice questions on CellPip where you maybe you're looking at a, a picture of a, a post office where a lot of people are inside a room maybe and they're, they're all there to mail off parcels or pick things up. And I have had questions like this from past test takers. So some people say, I didn't know it was a post office. I thought it was a bank. You know, I talked about this question as if everybody's there to do their personal banking. If you make a small mistake like that, it's not going to be the end of the world, provided you are describing the actions that everyone is doing authentically. So whether you're at a post office or a bank, you're probably still going to be up at a counter. You're probably still talking to the sales clerk, dropping off your paperwork, collecting a parcel, something like that. So provided you've got all of your actions described precisely and accurately, it's fine. If in your overview, you accidentally say, I'm looking at an image of a bank, but it's actually a post office, making one little mistake like that is not going to lower your score drastically. Okay, it is only one tiny, tiny error. You've misspoken, you've, you've identified the room incorrectly. <clears throat> so that would be considered under your um, task fulfillment, I guess, how clearly you're answering the question. But again, remember when cell PIP is being scored, the raters are looking at four different dimensions altogether. So they're looking for lots of skill sets, things like sentence structure, grammar, vocabulary use, how well you're speaking, your public speech delivery. So provided you do all of these things correctly, again, making that one little mistake is not something to worry about too much. Okay, just get those actions and the objects themselves identified correctly. You should know if it's a person at the desk or if it's somebody entering the bank with their, their young child in a stroller or whatever it happens to be. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brandy. Um, here's another question. I think it's a very timely question. What should we use for common genders like doctors, lawyers? Do we use his, her, or their? That is an excellent question, and it might vary depending on perhaps even where you live in the world and what's common practice where you're from. I know uh, in Canada in particular, there's a huge push for equality, and we're looking at um, not discriminating against different genders. It's become much more common practice to use the gender neutral pronoun they. I do that in my practices now as a teacher because I have so many people in my classrooms from all over the world who identify uh, with different sexes altogether. So in this case, if you are referring to a doctor and later you say they, um, I would like to think that the raters are understanding that gender neutrality, okay? In the past, they is, is actually a plural word. So it gets confusing if you're referring to one person as they, but when we don't know the, uh, the sex or you're not wanting to um, assign a he or a, a she to that person out of respect, then using that they is acceptable, uh, more so now than ever. Yeah, so it's, it's commonly done. So, and if you wanna get away from that, I guess you would just keep referring to the doctor, that person, you know, the, uh, but how many times can you say the doctor? It gets really repetitive. So yeah, if you slip in the word they, then that would be fine too. Yes, a wonderful question. When in doubt, use they. Um, we have another question. How can we check ourselves for, or I think the question is how do how does one kind of prepare themselves for a self of speaking test? Like how do they make sure that what they're saying is right before they write the test? Yeah, uh, again, practice, practice, practice. Um, we have we have a lot of webinars that we deliver that go over practice test questions. So and you, when you sign up for these free webinars, you actually get study packs. So you get other sample response questions that you can try at home. Uh, even if you want to make up your own. So remember the presentation I just delivered, I used that, the picture of the men making music. That was from a real past self hip test, but I just went on Shutterstock and I downloaded that picture of the family on the picnic because it had enough action going on that I could use that to practice the skills. So if you're speaking, um, again, every task requires different skill sets, but you know you're going to have images on three different tasks, namely tasks three, four, and eight. So for this skill set, it's wise on your end just to get your hands, download a picture from the internet even if you want that is interesting to you. 
And I wouldn't do any timed practice to start. I, I might not even speak at first. I might just sort of write down my ideas. And then in the comfort of your own home, you would start speaking out loud to describe what you see. When you've run through that a few times, I would encourage you to then record your voice right into your cell phone. Play it back so you can hear what you're saying. You know, I also like to ask our test takers to create their own transcripts. So when you're listening to your own recorded voice, uh, again, it's private, nobody can hear you, so don't be shy, but type out your own transcript and then look at the structures you're using. Start to identify, do you have subjects and verbs in every sentence that you're speaking? You might be surprised to find out what you're missing because as we're talking out loud and, and not listening to ourselves as an audience, Sometimes we think we're on the right track, but we realize we're making errors. So uh, do all of that practice at home. Don't worry about the time yet. Once you've done enough of that practice and you're starting to improve on your own structures, this is where you want to set a timer. So on cell PIP, you're usually speaking for 60 seconds. There are two tasks that will ask you to speak for 90. So it's really important to authentically reproduce that. Task eight that we just talked about, you're speaking for 60 seconds and you have 30 seconds to think about what you're going to say. So set your timer, you know, take 30 seconds to pick what you want to talk about when your, your minute begins, record it, listen to it back, uh, approach it as if it were the real test. Okay, you can practice by yourself or even with friends. I know sometimes people like to study together. I think that's a great idea. If you do have access to a tutor or to a prep program, presumably it would be online right now with the pandemic. Uh, sometimes an English teacher can also go over the responses with you to make sure your grammar and your skills are, are uh, adequate. But yeah, do a lot of self-assessment and self-practice too. It's the best way to get comfortable. If you go into this test knowing you've done this before and you can do it, you're going to minimize your stress right there and you'll hopefully be much more successful. Okay, um, sorry, we're getting quite a few questions here. So I was a little distracted. Um, but there was a question that had come way earlier when you were doing the presentation. And I think this is a question in relation to when you were talking about is versus are and you know, continuing tense. This question um, is very specific to that. And it's about what if we say this person seems to be doing this instead of saying is doing this? Okay, um, if you said this person seems to be doing such and such, I guess grammatically it's, it's correct, but what you're doing is you're sounding very, uh, you're not sounding confident at all. So when you're looking at these pictures, uh, you need to be decisive. The readers are looking to see what you can describe. So use strong language in order to maximize your score there for vocabulary use as well. So, you know, assess the situation, decide what he's doing and go for it. This man is dancing on his hands, <laughs> you know, not hmm, this person seems to be doing. It's a little bit weaker when you approach it that way. So, yeah, I would definitely use strong language and even the verbs that you choose. You're going to want them to be strong action verbs to the best of your ability. Um, I know in my sample, I used somewhat simpler language. I think I said the father is reading a book. You know, you can start to think of synonyms. What's a more interesting way of saying reading, you know, uh, and, and, and go through it that way as well. Be decisive, use strong language. It'll go a long ways to help enhance your vocabulary use. Thank you. Um, last question, and I'm not sure, can I use control plus F shortcut in, shortcut in reading? Oh, yeah. you know what, there are editing tools for writing, but not for reading. So I know, uh, I know what we would do in the real world if we were researching for things, sometimes we do a little search for to find keywords, right, in articles, and that will help show us where we need to continue reading. On the cell pit test itself for reading, you're going to be assessed on how well you can understand the question and find that information in the short text provided. So the text that you're reading on cell pip the longest that you would find would be maybe four paragraphs, possibly five for the reading text. So you, we really need to practice our skills of skimming and scanning as we go through that text and find those keywords ourselves. That's partly what you're being assessed on. If we were just simply able to type in a keyword and have the computer show us, we're not uh, demonstrating that we have those abilities ourselves. So unfortunately on the test, no, we don't have those uh, shortcuts, not for the reading. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brandy, we have another question, which is, I'm pretty sure you've answered this many, many times, but just one once more. Um, 
if we do not finish our answer in 60 sec 60 seconds, seconds. Um, is it is it okay? Uh, as soon as your 60 seconds of time is up, the computer is just going to stop recording. So basically finished or not, that's all that's going to be submitted to the rater to give you a score. So as you're speaking, it, it is really important to keep an eye on the countdown timer. And when it's almost at that 60 second mark or at the end, you're going to want to wrap up and finish what you're talking about. You need to make sure you've answered all parts of the question. So again, going back to task eight, which is what we looked at today, Today, we only focused on describing action. Remember, there's always going to be some sort of a role play in that question. So in this test question, it was to invite Katya down to share the day with us, to watch those men play music. So you have to remember to insert that detail somewhere before the time runs out. If you forget and time is up, unfortunately, you haven't answered the question completely in that regard, okay? If you are in the middle of your closing remark and it's very clear you, you're just about done, it's your last sentence, and the computer cuts you off halfway through that last sentence, that's not a big deal, as long as you provided lots of detail before that. The raters are not looking for perfection. It doesn't have to be 60 seconds on the nose, but you certainly want to uh, present as much detail as you can and save yourself five or six seconds for that concluding statement to the best of your ability. And again, this is where practice at home comes in handy. You'll get to feel what it's like to talk for 60 seconds when you do it enough times, and that will help you on test day for sure. Great. Um, Brandy, I think we've uh, come to the end of our questions pertaining to self test and your presentation. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, as always, everybody is finding this extremely helpful and are very happy to have you here. Excellent. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that starting the next time I'm on in a few weeks time or maybe a month or so we're going to get into some listening activities so a lot of the feedback that I've had from test or from viewers online I suppose writing in have been asking for more practice with the listening so we're going to start with listening four and then we'll go through part five and part six so uh, we've done quite a bit of speaking and writing to date between our first two seasons of self Help live so I think it's time to switch gears. So we'll get into some listening next and we'll follow that up with some reading into the new year. So join me then. I look forward to it. <laughs> Wonderful. So more listening exercises in the future, guys. Get ready. Okay. Um, now it's time for us to go do our news updates. We're looking for CELPIP test takers to share their journey. We want to hear from you guys. And if you want to be featured on our website and come on our YouTube channel, please fill in our short survey. Um, we will be sharing that in the chat below. If, you're look, if you have written the CELPIP test and you want to be featured on our website and on YouTube, please do fill up that survey. It is a short one and we will be sharing it in our chat below. If you're looking for last minute self test openings, uh, remember that we share them on Instagram stories. Um, you will be able to see if we have opened any last minute uh, openings. You can also go on our website and enter your email on our header on top for notifications and you will get an email as well for last minute openings. Okay, that's it for news updates. Let's find out the answer to our trivia question. So I asked you in the beginning of our episode, which province in Canada is home to Canada's tallest mountain? And many of you said Alberta, but one person said maybe Yukon. I think that's nine killers. Um, so you got it right. It is Yukon and uh, the mountain is called Mount Logan. It is Canada's highest mountain. So if you are in Yukon, you have another thing to be proud of. And that's it. Thank you for joining us and subscribing to our channel. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and more importantly, share it with anybody else you think might find it useful. Our next episode uh, will be on the 19th of October. If you have questions that you couldn't get answered today, please leave it in the comments below or send us an email at communications at paragontesting.ca. You can always connect with us through any of our social media channels. All updates will be posted there as well. So do follow us there. Uh, our handle is at Test Official on Instagram, and we post a lot of good content on there. Um, so until our next episode, please stay safe and wash your hands. Bye.